It's an absolute pleasure to welcome in the longtime voice of the Crimson Tide, Eli Gold. Of course, we are going to uh, kind of set the stage for the latest Crimson Tide Sports Network Classic Alabama football game. 12-week series. We're carrying them all right here on Tide 100.9 FM every Saturday and Sunday at noon. This Saturday and Sunday, we've got the 2012 BCS title game, Alabama and LSU at the Mercedes-Benz Superdome. And it was payback time for the Crimson Tide in that one. Good morning, Eli. Good morning, Gary. How are you? I'm doing real well. Always a pleasure to catch up with you, my well, friend. Well, you too. You too. It's been uh, been a while, and always nice to chat with your listeners in T-Town. Good to have you on. I, I'm enjoying this series. I even called you the, the first one that, yes. when Alabama yes. was playing Clemson in 2008, the kind of the start of this amazing run for Nick Saban in the second season. And and I said this earlier, it's amazing how much you forget about these games once a little time passes. And I was listening to that game, and it was it was taking me back. And I had forgotten that that was the year after the snake and the year before Phil Savage, and you had the rotating analyst. So I called Eli, and I'm like, who's on the radio with you, That's Eli? Right. We we had, uh, I believe it was 13 different color analysts that year. Uh, one guy worked a couple of games. But, uh, yes, uh, we were in search of a new analyst, and we just decided that the best way to do it, uh, since it was no heir apparent, was to have different players, different coaches, people from Alabama's history to come on in and, and, and see how it worked out. And that first game was Antonio Langham, and uh, he worked worked with me that day, but uh, you know what's amazing, too? I, I enjoy sometimes some of the names, and I'll say, oh, yeah, I remember him. He did such and such, or, and even from a business standpoint, you know, doing a commercial for Singular Wireless, you know, which mm-hmm. now all these years later became part of the AT&T family. Uh, I mean, it's just kind of, it's, it's a bit of a throwback in many different regards. Well, it is. And, and this game we've got coming up this weekend from the Crimson Tide Sports Network is is a doozy. And it, yep. it's ironic that I've got you on today to preview it because I talked about it earlier in the week in, in regards to the April 27th tornado. And it was against that backdrop that that Alabama 2011 football season would be played. Uh, an incredible football team. But Eli, I think what a lot of people – forget since Alabama won the BCS National Championship game was that the Tide, after losing to LSU on November 5th in that classic one versus two matchup sure. in overtime nine to six, didn't control its own destiny, didn't even win the SEC West or the SEC Championship, but fate smiled on Alabama and Tuscaloosa. The Tide got what it needed from, from Oregon losing and Oklahoma State losing, and the next thing you know, Alabama's in that national championship game, a uh, chance at redemption against LSU. And, of course, looking at life through crimson-colored glasses, as I do, uh, I, I still maintain Alabama, and the fact that it was a rematch was nothing wrong with that. There were a lot of people across the country forgetting the teams involved. A lot of folks just didn't want a rematch, period. They thought that was wrong. And then, of course, the SEC haters uh, hated the fact that uh, there were two SEC schools going at it. And uh, there were people in the media who were concerned that, you know, with Alabama and, and LSU being so close geographically that you can drive from one campus to the next, that people elsewhere in the country wouldn't care. Uh, there, there were a lot of um, negatives being tossed out there. Uh, but so it goes, and and then I was, you know, I was concerned as a fan. I was concerned as a fan because Bama did not score a touchdown in that one versus two matchup. You're now playing in LSU's backyard, That's what right. sixty, seventy, you know, miles away from Baton Rouge. Uh, you knew the building was going to be as great as Alabama travels. You knew the building was going to be heavily weighted towards the LSU Tigers, I never imagined sitting down for that broadcast that night that LSU was going to need a roadmap to find the 50-yard line. I mean, that, it was just amazing. It really was. And I remember, Eli, of course, you called the game in that one versus two, and a lot of people don't remember the 9-6 game. LSU was number one and Alabama was number two. Right. I – I walked away from that game that night watching in the press box, and, and LSU was a great football team, and that's one reason I, I was so pumped up about the rematch. 
because I, as well as LSU played and they deserved to win, I didn't feel like they were the better football team, though. I really didn't. What, what was your takeaway from that first matchup after having called every play? Well, again, I'm, I'm biased, and I'm guilty as charged. Uh, I thought Alabama was the better team. I thought man for man, uh, you know, line up this guy versus that guy, this guy versus that guy. I thought, honestly, that Alabama was the better team. But in sports, you got to win the ball game, as we all know. And That's Bama right. did not win that 9-6 affair, even though it did go to overtime. Uh, you know, it, it, I, I still personally thought that Alabama was the better team. I agree with you wholeheartedly. I just didn't know at that point, walking out of the press box that night, whether the Tide was ever going to have an opportunity. I mean, I was, you know, my my chin was on the ground like Mm -hmm. the fans were. Uh, I just didn't know if Bama was going to get all the breaks necessary to get back into a Alabama-LSU matchup for the national title. You get to New Orleans with Phil Savage and, and uh, the, the CTSN crew, and you're preparing for the game. And I know while you're calling the game, you're, you're focused on doing your job and, right. and, and relaying the pictures to the, the listening audience. But while you and Phil Savage were calling the game and you're watching this unfold, I'm wondering if during a timeout or some point you just looked at each other and were amazed by how dominant the Alabama defensive effort was that night. Yes, I remember that vividly. I, we looked at each other and, and we, I, I probably said something that I, I'm, you know, I'm not going to use on the air now, but uh, <laughs> we weren't on the air at that moment either. It was during a commercial break. But, uh, you know, and, and Phil was always really good at that. Phil would, I'd always ask Phil before we went on the air, maybe five or seven minutes before we started talking. I'd say, all right, Philbert. I always called him Philbert. I said, all right, Philbert. I said, what do you think? And he would always tell me. I mean, even at the Notre Dame game, the blowout down in uh, Miami, you know, Phil said to me, he said, he said, if we play the way we can, he said, this game is over in the first quarter. I mean, he knows his football. Mm -hmm, No doubt. And he was obviously right. We were telling stories before the first quarter was out against uh, the Fighting Irish. In this game, he said to me, he said, our defense is just unbelievable. He said, don't know if that's going to be enough. He said, we have to score points. Well, then somewhere middle of the game, I don't know where and when it was, I looked at him. He said, I told you our defense is damn good. I said, yeah, you did. <laughs> not, that he, not that I didn't realize it, but, uh, you know, that was what Phil had. But did, I don't know if either of us imagined that you know it would be late in the day before LSU finally get acro- got across the 50 yard line and 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 the degree of a s- smackdown that it was as as much of a Bama fan as we are and all the fans were I don't know how many truly honestly believed that it was going to be a 21 nothing whitewash do you hope for it We'd say, boy, wouldn't that be great if we shut them out in their in their place? We, you know, close enough to mm-hmm. their campus. Uh, I said, wouldn't that be something? I don't know how many people truly imagined that that was going to happen. But son of a gun, we were good. And then when Trent took it in for that finishing touchdown, uh, that was, uh, you know, then it was time to breathe. Indeed, it was visiting with Eli Gold, longtime voice of the Crimson Tide. Crimson Tide Sports Network is rebroadcasting classic Alabama football games this Saturday at noon and Sunday at noon here on Tide 100.9. We will have the 2012 BCS title game. You said earlier... when you listen- I was talking to the guys at Learfield IMG College, our rights holders, uh, yesterday on, a, on another matter, and they were telling me that uh, our, the, result, the reviews and the, the ratings have been outstanding on these games. They were, we were talking about our affiliate in Pensacola, and they sold the spots, and they're sold out, and Mobile, and so on. And the guy, the guy at Learfield, who is probably, if anything, a Missouri fan, uh, but it had nothing to do with that. But he, he said, I, we were talking about how successful the series has been. And he goes, yeah, too bad you guys don't have, have any great games to replay, huh? I said, yeah, yeah, we, 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 we couldn't find 12 games to replay. <laughs> so uh, we're, we're blessed to have these kind of games to be able to 
repackaged for our fans and our listeners. Especially during this, this these uncertain times. And I oh, said, God, be- yeah. Eli, before you were on, and you mentioned how you'll hear a commercial and it'll take you back. The thing that I find interesting, you know, and like you said, you can be a broadcaster and then also be a fan. And we, we know how to separate the two. And when I'm listening to you call a game on one of these these great games I'm, I'm listening as a fan and I find and I know this sounds crazy but I think other fans feel the same way Joe said the same thing that you're reliving the game you've forgotten so many moments and you still get nervous <laughs> oh gosh yeah we, I, I was watching a game on I know one of those replays on uh, SEC network or whatever it was and I'm sitting here with my wife with Claudette and uh, it was the Georgia game the one that Bama won in overtime with Tua and so on and Claudette looks at me at one point. She goes, why the heck am I nervous? She goes, I know how this is going to end. Uh, that's just because you get caught up in it. Uh, you, you do. You get caught up with it. And it's, uh, you know, and you're a fan and you, you still, you know, I mean, how many of us still cringe watching or listening to that Georgia game? How many of us still cringe when, when Tua took that sack mm. in overtime? I mean, you know it's coming. You know what's coming in the play after that, but you still cringe when it happens. You know, get rid of the ball, get rid of the ball. You know, and it's, I guess that's because we're human beings and we, we wear our, our support for our school on, on our sleeve. We do, and uh, and these games are, are bringing back those those memories. As I said, Eli, these are tough times, uncertain times with the pandemic. Uh, before I ask you a sports-related question, you mentioned sure. Claudette and uh, your beautiful wife and, of course, uh, your daughter Elise. How are you as a family dealing with, with this pandemic? How's it going personally? We're doing fine. Thank you for asking. Uh, you know, we are, uh, Elise, of course, has her own place. She's, she's out of the house, but she's doing well. And uh, she works for a company in Birmingham that uh, has uh, subsidiaries all across the globe. So she is working from home via computer. Uh, she normally travels a good bit for her employer. But uh, she works for EBSCO. Uh, she normally travels a good bit internationally, and obviously all of that has been put off. She travels a lot domestically, and that, too, has all been put off. But she's fine, and Claudette and I are, are doing well. We're, uh, we're staying home. You know, we are in our 60s, uh, so thank God. Otherwise, we're healthy. But, uh, you know, you don't want to tempt fate. So, you know, we stay in. Of course, we, we, we're lucky to have a, a, a sizable uh, backyard and a nice piece of property. So, you know, you can sit out in the yard. Claudette's been working out there, doing whatever with the flowers and this, that, and the other. And, you know, you don't have to stay inside. You can stay on your property. Uh, we're using one of those grocery delivery services uh, uh, just because. I mean, it's there and no need to to tempt fate. But, you know, we're doing okay. I, I've caught up on my reading a good bit. Um, you are one of three interviews that I'm doing today uh, at 1030 this morning. I'm on with a station down in Miami. And then later today, I'm on with a station in Denver, Colorado. Uh, they want to talk about Tua and Raekwon mm-hmm. and, and Jerry Judy. And I've done a ton of those uh, type of interviews already. So, um, you know, <clears throat> I'm, we're fine. We're doing well. And just like everybody else, hopeful that this ends or is under control sooner rather than later and that there is indeed a college football season on the horizon. That's where I was going next. And, of course, you as a sportscaster got – along with the spring sports athletes and coaches, some broadcasting duties cut short. You do a lot of work through the Crimson Tide Productions for the SEC Digital Network, baseball, softball, other sports. But now our focus clearly is on on the football season, Eli. And uh, (laughs) what is your, you know, just – and and I get it. I have to say this every time. I don't want to make sports bigger than it is. I mean, these yeah. are real life issues, and we understand that. But there's nothing wrong, I think, with wanting and hoping we have a college football season. What what's your gut telling you in regards to the pandemic and whether or not we're going to have college football in the fall? You know, I I, I don't know, Gary, and I I certainly I even hesitate to say anything because something that comes out of my mouth oftentimes can be construed as a statement from the university. I am not uh, in that position. That's way out of my 
area of expertise or responsibility. I was encouraged that at least yesterday we heard from Finus St. John, uh, the chancellor of the Alabama system, who said there are wishes and plans in place to open up in the fall. And, uh, of course, that is important because, I, as we've heard from Commissioner Sankey and others, uh, the football will not be played if the students aren't on campus. Uh, and, and of course, uh, you know, as Mr. St. John also said, that's our plan as we're sitting here and talking. It was yesterday on the 29th of April. He said, we hope that, you know, we hope that, that plays out, but, there, you know, you never know. But those are the plans of today. So, you know, I was encouraged to hear that. Um, then, of course, you read other people across the country who, who are saying different things regarding their universities. So I don't know. Uh, the bottom line is everybody's health and welfare has to come first. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. You know, everybody's health and welfare has to come first. You're not going to, uh, whether it's the fans, whether it's the worker bees, whether it's the players themselves, uh, everybody's personal health and welfare must come first. And, and everybody knows that. Greg Byrne knows that. Uh, you know, everybody at the university, Finest St. John knows that, uh, you know, President Bell, everybody. So I'm just hopeful. You know, I am hopeful that, uh, you know, that everything is back to a degree. And I don't know, who knows, are the games going to be played with people in the uh, stadium, without people in the stadium, with this, that, that, who knows. And that's, again, well out of my area of responsibility. I have no idea. But uh, I know when they put the ball on the tee, whenever the heck that is, I'm going to be chomping at the bit to talk about it. Wrapping up with Eli Gold, again, listen for classic Alabama football games on the Crimson Tide Sports Network this Saturday and Sunday at noon. It's the 2012 BCS National Championship game between Alabama and LSU. You mentioned the draft, Alabama, nine players selected all in the first three rounds. Yep. You were calling that game at Mississippi State when Tua went down. It looked bad. It was bad. But yep. from the moment the injury happened, Alabama was on it medically. All the right moves were made. And I think it's remarkable uh, that he is back <laughs> throwing the football, uh, looking like he's close to 100%, and was the fifth overall pick by the Miami Dolphins. What a great story. Well, it's a great story. I mean, And, of course, so many things had to come into play there. Ultimate bottom line is – Tua had to have that kind of talent, which, you know, without that, uh, he wouldn't have been number five. He wouldn't have been number 305. You know, he had to have that kind of talent, which mm -hmm. he did. It was, it was God-given. Um, the university's medical staff, uh, you know, we all talk about Jeff Allen, the trainer, but I'm talking now about the doctors themselves. The game was, had barely resumed and Lyle Kane was on the phone with his contacts all across America, finding out who is the best guy to handle. I mean, he's on the phone, not you know, not 20 minutes after the injury, uh, seeking out this guy in Houston, Texas. Um, so they, you know, they had the right people in place. They went to the very best experts. Two, as many athletes, has to be motivated to go through that all sorts of rehab. And I don't know all the exercises and what have you, but, you know, uh, zipping around on that little scooter and the whole bit that he went through. Uh, I'm sure it wasn't pleasant. Um, so everything had to be done with a thousand percent dedication. And it was. So uh, when you work hard and you got the right people in your corner, uh, you know, and, and again, the doctor was there to get everything situated immediately. Uh, and, and when we say a doctor, I mean, we're talking world class, the Andrews people. It's not, you know, some chopped liver doctor. It's, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's world class physicians. So everything worked. Tua worked hard and I'm, I'm thrilled for him. I, I'm so glad for him. And I, I'm, I'm happy for Raekwon that, uh, you know, he's, he's back there with a, with a teammate uh, again. The two of them went together and it was just some great stories all throughout the draft. It was, uh, you know, everybody had wonderful stories to tell and um, it, it was just so wonderful, so pleasing 
to see the Alabama guys uh, get picked as they did. And also, uh, Tua and, and Jalen are going to f- be forever linked. And to see Jalen uh, be the 53rd overall pick in the second round by the yeah. Eagles after a lot of pundits said he would never be draftable. Uh, what an accomplishment by exactly. him, too. Exactly. He was very – and, you know, they, it, it, it was interesting. A lot of the – you read the – you know, Philadelphia is a tough sports team. Absolutely. The toughest. And- it is, and you know, that's where they famously booed Santa Claus. You know, if you boo Santa Claus, man, nobody's nobody's uh, exempt. But uh, you know, he's 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 got a good guy ahead of him to learn from. If he doesn't play regularly, you know, for a little while. Speaking of Jalen, well, he'll learn, and I'm sure, as we've heard from um, you know from the Eagles coaching staff, they're going to have certain packages in there for him to utilize his particular skill set. So uh, I was very, very pleased for him. And uh, I just wish just in general, and I know you can't because it's not how the system works, but it would have been nice if he could have been drafted as a Crimson Tide slash Oklahoma so that each school got credit you know, for it. But obviously, that's not how it works. But overall, I'm I'm thrilled for him. And you're right. There's there's not going to be. He is going to win over those Philadelphia fans simply because of how classy a guy he is, and and the fact that he can also play ball. But he is. I mean, you see, when those people start turning on the tube and listening to the radio and hearing interviews with him and hearing him talk and so on, uh, there's no way that even in the hardened uh, atmosphere of Philadelphia. There's no way they're not going to be uh, captivated by how special he is. Well, Joe's about to have a heart attack, Eli. I got to get this break, Joe. I promise Joe, you, Eli. Uh, Eli knew when the, I got him on the radio. It'd the be... commercials that you're playing now pays Joe's salary. You <laughs> see, that's the deal. So he's 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 he wants that spot in. But listen, it's been great to be on with you guys as always. And call anytime, Gary. I love watching you. Uh, my wife and I we we watch the news on certain stations. We hop around. We catch the sports, and we always come to VUA to to see what you've got to say. So keep up the great work. Thank you, Eli. Always a pleasure. All right, man. Take care.